Okay. Good. All right. Uh, so today we've got uh, Cotter and Devin, and they're going to be talking about a penetration testing platform for the Internet of Things. Uh, I know absolutely nothing about this, but I'm sure they will illuminate you all with some uh, wonderful knowledge. I know they've worked really hard, so best of luck and give them your full attention. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you guys very much for attending our presentation. And CJ, thank you for the warm introduction there. Uh, as stated, my name is Kader Almar. I'm um, Devin Richards. And we're here to present to you our project on the DK Secured Things Penetration Testing Platform for the Internet of Things. And we'll talk about what all those terms mean here as we move along. So we're going to begin with a quick outline of our project and kind of give you a uh, ground for what we're going to talk about. We're going to begin with an introduction, talk about what IoT is, which is a acronym for Internet of Things. We're going to discuss how penetration testing relates to IoT. We're going to define the problem, the security ramifications, and the impact of our platform and of investigating security in the Internet of Things. We're going to provide some background information and our proposed solution for the investigation of security in IoT. We're going to briefly explain our three test cases and provide demos of each along with explanations as we go. We're going to go over our results uh, as a result of actually applying the penetration testing to our own platform. We're going to deliver our final thoughts and some of the things we thought of as we came up with this project and talk a little bit about the future work of what a capstone uh, team in the future might want to do if they were to pick up this project and run with it. So what is IoT? IoT stands for the Internet of Things and the things in this instance are uh, smart devices that are interconnected with the internet that sometimes may otherwise not be. Uh, a couple examples of this would be th uh, smart thermostat, smart coffee maker, Wi-Fi baby cam, uh, devices such as that. These are usually supported by software where all of that data is sent to a user in a readable format. And then, as we said earlier, uh, penetration testing is also uh, part of our project. Uh, this is the authorized use of hacking or testing a uh, software or computer platform for weaknesses and vulnerabilities with the intent of learning how to mitigate these vulnerabilities and weaknesses. So we'll discuss a little bit about the impact of IoT and why we really care, because at the end of the day everything boils down to dollars and cents. So in, by the year 2020, the expected spending for IoT is projected to be to be at $267 billion and more than double that at $742 billion by the year 2023. The majority of the spending will be in the sectors of healthcare, manufacturing, transportation, and utilities. And some examples of these use cases could be manu uh, manufacturing robots, smart cars or connected cars that we already have on the roads, uh, as well as autonomous vehicles. Utilities could involve smart cities or connected grids. And the healthcare, some of you may have smart watches or smartphones that monitor your health stats as you're running. Those are all connected devices that companies are adopting very, very quickly. So in our research, we identified some security risks with uh, these IoT devices. Uh, generally, the IoT devices are lightweight in nature. Uh, they consist of small sensors to send to a centralized server. Uh, these sensors usually don't have the computing power to implement proper security measures, so the security is not as robust. Um, we also found, uh, as recently as last year, these IoT devices were actually exploited in a massive botnet, consisting of millions and millions of devices. Now, what a botnet is, is basically uh, a hacker is able to take a number of devices, computers, uh, and use them in any way they see fit. So they were able to access all of these insecure IoT devices and utilize them in attacking some popular platforms like Amazon, uh, Twitter, Spotify, and PayPal. Uh, we actually found that the data transmitted from these IoT devices is also insecure, so we can sniff and replay that information at a later time. Uh, we also got a little funny video here. Uh, the government themselves actually can be a malicious user occasionally. Uh, th recently this year, uh, some classified documents were released showing that the CIA actually had tools that uh, exploited popular IoT devices, such as the Amazon Echo. So we're going to play a short video clip. This is the Amazon Echo Dot, so it's a smaller version of the traditional Amazon Echo. And uh, let's just have some fun with this. Alexa, would you lie to me? I always try to tell the truth. I'm not always right, but I would never intentionally let you or anyone else. Alexa, what is the CIA? The United States Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. 
Alexa, are you connected to the CIA? It shuts so. off. Alexa, I cannot lie to you. Are you connected to the CIA? So while not technically explicitly saying it's connected to the CIA, uh, the documents released earlier this year are proof that uh, the CIA actually does have the capabilities to utilize these devices and uh, listen to all your conversations. And just like our founding fathers, it cannot tell a lie. So it can't tell us that it is or is not connected to the CIA, but we just thought that was an interesting little quip there. Um, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the issues facing IoT and as they relate to the bigger picture of security. So security is not the only thing. We do, sec the lack of security is that device manufacturers are not implementing basic security protocols on these devices. They are lightweight devices. They don't have the same processing and uh, storage path capacity as your computer, your laptop, or your uh, smartphone. So they can't really secure them as well, but they're also going out of their way to make the devices have weak passwords, which are very easy to uh, uh, crack, as we'll demonstrate at a later time. The data between these devices is also unencrypted, which means that anyone with moderate set of skills that Dr. Sleeve is so gracious to teach us can view the data being sent, even in this room, wirelessly, and replay that data and ga gather information from that data. In addition, there are so many companies out there with IoT devices. Uh, any, at any given time, you have between two and three dozen companies, the most popular ones being Facebook, fa sorry, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and uh, uh, Apple creating IoT devices for any number of purposes. Every company comes up with their own standards, and there's no agreed upon way of going about things. In addition, since there's so much fragmentation, there's no oversight over this. With your smartphones and with your Wi-Fi, you have the FCC that regulates how much power you can use, and you have other uh, organizations that keep make your computers work in a very organized fashion. Because IoT is so new and so wild, uh, there's no government organization saying, let's create standards, let's create protocols, and make sure everyone agrees on these. Last and not least, just like the CIA that we joked about earlier, the three principal um, the three principles of security when we talk about security are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The confidentiality aspect is that someone can't view your data as it's being sent. The integrity is proving that the person that says they sent it is the one who actually sent it, so you verify that they are the sender. The availability of the information is exactly what it sounds like. We want, we want to have access to that information at any given time and have it secured and have it be trusted the lack of security in IoT compromises these three fundamental principles. So a little background info, uh, some research relating uh, to our project. Initially we were going to use a already established IoT platform and conduct penetrating, uh, penetration testing on that. However, we ruled out that that couldn't really happen seeing as we didn't have full control over the system we'd be working with, so we wouldn't be able to monitor all the different aspects of it. Um, so this led us to create our own IoT platform, which students and users could use uh, to conduct IoT penetration testing uh, in their own localized environment, free of any ethical or legal risks. Our proposed solution is to implement a private IoT offering, and this involves deciding which devices we want to use, as well as creating the end-to-end -end architecture for anyone who makes use of our system. For our architecture, we chose to use some commonly and rather cheaply available components. So the first is the Raspberry Pi. This is a $35 credit card size computer. It has HDMI, it has network connectivity, and it can do a lot of the common functionalities that your desktop at home can. Attached to it is a device called a SenseHat. This is a $20 sensor board. It attaches in on some pins, which you can see here. And it provides information such as temperature, pressure, humidity. There's an LED grid here you can light up with fancy colors. Um, so it's a very cheap way of taking a board, adding some additional functionality to it, and making it a sensor device. In addition to that, we have just an off-the-shelf um, Wi-Fi camera, this is marketed as a baby monitor, but it can be used for home surveillance and security as well. This is made by TrendNet, it costs about 25 bucks on Amazon. So this is cheaply and easily available. Um, and these are mass manufactured devices that anyone can purchase, whether they're IoT or not. Tying all of these devices together is a protocol called MQTT. 
What MQTT is, it's the MQ Telemetry Transport Protocol. That's a bunch of fancy words. All that means is it's a great protocol suited for IoT and it's good at sending very short messages, which is what IoT devices are going to do. You're going to send the temperature or the pressure or the humidity. You're not going to send a picture or a YouTube video. These are small messages. Finally, we have a website for the users of the platform as well as the developers of the platform to make use of to integrate our architecture into any solution they might use. By implementing this solution in a custom fashion, we have complete control over the system. We can tweak it to our, our needs. We can make it more or less secure. And we can investigate and highlight the security vulnerabilities that IoT has. So a quick visualization of our end-to-end -end architecture here. Uh, we have our Sensat uh, directly on top of our Raspberry Pi, uh, taking in climate data. Then we have our uh, Wi-Fi monitor over here, sending pictures and data to the Raspberry Pi as well. And once the uh, Sensat has actually gathered that climate data, it is sent from the Raspberry Pi through whatever uh, access point or home network it's on to a centralized MQTT broker. Now what this broker does is it pushes all the messages uh, toward that it, that it receives from that Raspberry Pi to a subscriber of that topic. So the subscriber of the topic, um, my home for instance, would be getting all of the messages published from the Raspberry Pi if it's publishing to my home. So here we have our client who visits the web page. As soon as they visit the web page, they open a WebSocket connection, which is a connection utilized in IoT to perform real transfer uh, of data. So that connection stays open, and we see a real-time uh, update of all of the climate data that the Raspberry Pi generates. Um, going off what Devin said, the WebSocket's different than the traditional model in that when you open a website, your computer goes to Facebook and says, show me the page. Facebook says, okay, here's the page. And there's this constant back and forth and a lot of traffic. With the WebSocket, as Devin stated, it's an open connection and you don't have to keep asking for information. It'll keep sending it. Something to think about when you talk about MQTT, as you'll hear us talk about in the rest of the presentation, is that we're gonna say pub, sub, and topic. Think of it as getting a magazine subscription. You subscribe to the magazine, they send you one every month as long as you're paying. The topic could be the magazine of your choice, Sports Illustrated, uh, GQ, whatever you might like. So that's kind of a real world example of what all these terms tie into our architecture. Before we begin our demos, we want to set a quick scenario overview and some of the expectations so you guys know how we're approaching this entire problem. In our scenario, we're assuming that a malicious user has used penetration testing techniques to crack the Wi-Fi password and gain access to your home network. Once they're inside your network, they can potentially have access to the information sent on your network, and as well as the information sent between the IoT devices, which is the focus of our investigation. So a quick overview of our scenarios. Uh, for our first test case, we will be intercepting uh, connection information that the Raspberry Pi is going to be taking uh, and sending to our IoT, uh, our MQTT broker. Um, so we'll be intercepting that, conne uh, that connection information and now that we have that, an attacker would be able to spoof and send a message to the user that they would see that wouldn't actually be true. Uh, in our second test case, we'll have a denial of service attack. Basically what that would be doing is we'd be overloading the MQTT broker with illegitimate messages to try and take it down or slow it. Uh, in this instance, that, in the, as we'll show, uh, this will show um, legitimate and illegitimate traffic both cannot actually be processed by the broker because it's being, uh, it's having a denial of service attack. And for the third test case. What we're gonna demonstrate in the third test case is we're gonna intercept the messages sent between the camera and the Raspberry Pi, and we're gonna send those in a, a what's called a base 64 encoding, which I'll explain later, and be able to replay those messages uh, at a later time. And that's just demonstrating the fact that this information is wide open. So again, for the visual representation of our first test case, what we're going to be focusing on here is the uh, connection between the Raspberry Pi uh, wirelessly sending to, in this instance, the home network. We're going to be looking at that data stream right there, seeing the connection information we can pick up and possibly use to spoof the user. So we're going to quickly demonstrate that over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a small script on my laptop here. And this is connecting to the Raspberry Pi. And what this is, is it just tells it to grab temperature, pressure, and humidity data. 
humidity data and send it to the, um, the user view, which we also have to pull up here. Uh, dead VMware oh, I see. So we're going to want to show how the messages are coming from the Pi. They're going to the MQTT broker, which is kind of that middleman, and they're being shown in real time to the user view. Uh, I don't know why it yelled at me for some reason. So what we have here is just a small landing page. You can choose between the developer view and the user view. In our case, we're going to show what the end user would see. So we're going to click on user view. And here we have the topic that they're currently subscribed to in our analogy magazine subscription. So my home in this instance, they will be receiving all the messages that the Raspberry Pi publishes to that topic. So all we have to do is run this script here and it will demonstrate uh, the real time uh, data gathering of the Raspberry Pi. As you can see over here, we just got a temperature, pressure and humidity values. And as you can again see here, uh, they're updating every five, 10 seconds and uh, constantly taking in whatever input they're given. Yep. So this is how our architecture works in a normal scenario. Uh, now we're going to show how this is affected uh, in our first test case. The wire shirt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So here we have uh, a connection uh, initiated by the Pi. Uh, as you can see here, the authentication MQTT uses is very weak. It's base authentication, username, password, sent in clear text. So if a, if a malicious attacker is able to get onto your network and is able to pick up these messages, not only do they have the IP address of your broker that you're sending to, the broker again relays all the information published to it, uh, it has the uh, username and password to publish to that topic. Uh, in addition to that, they can also see the specific topic that you're publishing to, as well as the message format um, so they can more reliably spoof you and make you think you're seeing legitimate data when you were not really. So what we're going to do now is we're going to stop that script, which is gathering three environment uh, variables, and we're going to just gather temperature data for, for our instance just to keep things a little bit simpler. So again, here's the pie, and it's sending just temperature data. And once again, we can see that information using our uh, sniffing tool here. <coughs> And you can see how the formats change. So like Devin said, if the hacker is able to see this string, they can see there's brackets and uh, parentheses and uh, colons, they can figure out, okay, I'm gonna make this data look fake. Your, your house says about 69 degrees, it's pretty comfortable. What if we make it say 150? And with a normal sensor device, uh, this, may incline, this may make the user inclined to think oh, my house is on fire because what, I, what I'm seeing, I believe, is legitimate because we don't have any type of integrity check to say otherwise. And again, we can show that, um, again, running just, so I'm, I'm the hacker, I figured out the IP address of the broker, I figured out the topic, the username and password, and with that information, I can spoof this data and say, hey, your house is on fire, and you're freaking out, you're at home, you're at work, you're looking at this data and thinking, oh my goodness, my, either my sensor's gone bad, I'm being hacked, or my house is on fire. And who knows if you got to call 911 after that. So then go back to the... So then we'll move on to our second test case, which will be the denial of service. Now what we're going to focus on here is the disruption of the client's view of data from the broker. So basically what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be overloading the broker with I, uh, MQTT messages so it would not show up for the client uh, who's trying to find legitimate data. Uh, in addition, we'll also be slowing down the broker and in some instances, of, as we'll show, come to a complete halt. So again, I'm going to go back to the reliable laptop and I'm going to run four scripts and what these, what each of these scripts are doing, each of these, uh, uh, let me make that a little bit bigger for you guys. You see two, three, four, and five dot pi, those are Python files. And what each script is doing is it is sending one million messages to our broker here. So we're, we're basically on this side of the network diagram. We're going to attack this guy and, and flood him with messages to the point that the messages that the client would see are no longer visible. So I'm going to do that now. 
And the hacker, again, is able to do this, by the way, utilizing those same techniques we showed in the first demonstration. So they have that username and password, they have that topic, they know exactly what they're attacking. So we're going to flood the broker with messages. And we're going to go back to the user view. So and as you can see, yeah. it shows you've been hacked. And it's cycling between 2, 3, 4, and 5, which correlates to the files that we have. And it's going to keep flooding it with messages until uh, in right about 15 seconds or so, you're going to see it go down. Mm -hmm. So we'll just wait for that to happen. So in a little bit here, you're going to see a bunch of error messages basically saying, hey, uh, we are no longer able to publish to this broker. And you also see that that little number uh, that keeps cycling through there is also going to freeze. So I'm just going to see here. It takes about 15 or 20, 30 seconds. Yeah, fantastic. So as you can see, it cannot find the assigned requested uh, IP address, which in our instance is the broker from QTT. And the last message it was able to receive was this. Now this is, again, to remind you, is also in real time. So we should be seeing it gradually updating. We don't because the broker is being uh, denied service. You will see, however, that it was able to recover. The Mosquito uh, broker in this instance is robust enough to recover from these instances. However, we're only using one machine to try and deny this uh, broker service. If we used a botnet, for instance, uh, the Mariah botnet, we would have millions and millions of devices whose computing power we could utilize to try and take this out. So with that concluded, we'd like to move on to our third and final test case, which in this case is a man in the middle attack. And what a man in the middle attack is, is it kind of what it sounds like, how you play monkey in the middle. It's kind of the same way. You're able to insert yourself in the network or gain access to the network, and you're able to view the information sent over the network, and in some cases, you're able to manipulate that information. So you tell the person, okay, you're going to go to Amazon.com? No. You're going to come to me first. I'm going to get your credit card information, and then I'm going to go to Amazon as if, as if I'm the good guy. But they can do whatever they want with that uh, information in malicious uses. In our case, we're going to intercept the information sent between the Wi-Fi camera and the Raspberry Pi. This is, the Raspberry Pi is set up as a file server, and what the Wi-Fi camera is set up to do is send images, a snapshot, every 10 seconds to the Raspberry Pi. This information is sent over plain text and can be easily decrypted and viewed at a later time, which I'll demonstrate now. So rather than set up the camera and deal with some of the uh, issues that go along with that, I have a, again, Wireshark uh, file here that we previously saved. And what I'm going to do here is zoom in for us. And again, these are just wireless packets. This is the information being sent over the air, which was captured it previously. And I'm going to filter for FTP. So I know that the Pi and the camera are configured for FTP, which is a file transfer protocol. And as we can see here, the username is sent in plain text. It asks for the password, and it says login successful. And the password right here, oh, sorry, here we go. Password right here is specified as capstone in this case. So since I'm inside the network, I can see the username, I can see the password, and I can see the IP addresses that everything's being sent to. So not only can I intercept the information over the air, I can potentially take advantage of vulnerabilities in the FTP software and attack the Pi itself. We also see some of the commands that the camera and the Pi are negotiating. In this case, it's going to create a directory. And as it goes down, it's going to do this store command. And you can see the file name here is capstone2014, etc. jpeg. That's the file name of the image that we can intercept. So now not only do I know the IP address of the Pi, I know how to get into it with the username and password. I know what file is being stored. So now I can get that file and send it to my, my partner in crime, Devin, here for later use at a later time. In order to do that, we have yet another Python script. In this case, it's called encode.py. And what this does is it takes the JPEG image and it encodes it in base64. What base64 is, it is an encoding scheme used to transmit images over the internet. It is used for all kinds of multimedia. It's very popular. And it takes the images. Each um, pixel in the image has red, green, and blue values. It's able to convert that into a form the computer knows and understands. It scrambles it, as we'll see, 
sends it over the internet, and then can unscramble it at a later time. So what I'm going to demonstrate now is the scrambling aspect of it. Oh, sorry, wrong window. And again, we're back on that same user view. So since the malicious user knows the topic and the IP and the username and password of our broker, they're able to view the same page too. So you're seeing your home's climate data, but they're seeing it too. In this case, they'll see the image in its scrambled form. It's going to ask me for the file name, and I'll just type in the file name. It's going to encode it as base64. The topic, again, we know from our previous test cases is called My Home, so we'll enter that now. And we know the IP address, again, from our previous test cases, and we'll enter that now. And the image is scrambled and sent to the broker. Again, this is in base64 encoding. We can't make sense of it. But what a computer can do is they can take this information, they can recompile it, and they can regenerate the image, which in this case should show that guy. So that's the conclusion of our third test case. So moving on to the results of all of this, uh, in our scenarios and in our research, we found that IoT, at least MQTT, uh, the Mosquito Broker implementation specifically, is uh, very insecure using only a username and password authentication that, if not encrypted, is sent in clear text. So if a hacker is able to get in on a network using this protocol, they could potentially find the information needed to cause all kinds of havoc. Uh, additionally, again, the MQTT broker uh, Mosquito is susceptible to denial of service attack in which not only is service slowed down, but it at times may stop completely. Um, as for our test case three, the results uh, of that were that we can intercept the information, we can encode it and send it off, and the person on the other end can run another script to decode it and recreate the image that you see on the right screen there. We'd like to talk a moment about our future work. In this case, we won't go through all these bullet points. We'll just hit on some of the mo ones we thought were the most important. Um, the one suggestion we'd like to offer is to increase the number of penetration testing use cases that our platform implements. In our case, we only have three test cases. This could easily be expanded. We found one with uh, MQTT and Lua that we thought was interesting. So that might be a good starting place for another group to start with. In addition, we'd like to see a system developed that can allow people to add devices to the architecture without having to run all those windows that you guys saw me run, uh, as well as use other programming languages. Another major one, and probably one of the most important ones, is allowing the ability to add more devices per user and have some sort of user login and password. So not only do you see the information for one device, you can select between maybe a room in the house, have a user account, and have more expandability in that fashion. So just some concluding thoughts on this. Uh, I, think, I think we're yeah, going to time, time yeah, to show it. Um, so what in our architecture, we only used sensor devices. This just takes climate data, shows it on a web page, nothing to physically interact with the environment. In an extreme case, IoT security can be potentially dangerous if not implemented correctly. Here we have a video of a Jeep Grand Cherokee that has wireless capabilities. Now, uh, this vulnerability has been patched, so no need to return all your cars. Uh, but as we'll be seeing here shortly, a hacker used to be able to get into the car and mess around with any computerized system, which modern cars have a lot of computerized systems. They're able to change the speed, take off uh, slow the transmission, uh, and we'll see the rest here. So here, at this video, what it, what it is, is like, like Devin said, he's driving a Jeep car. He's got an ex-NSA hacker in the passenger seat with him. He's got a laptop similar to mine, and he's able to wire into the car's CAN bus system and lock the steering wheel. So you can see he's driving. He executes some fancy commands. Ah. Wake up, wake up. That's why that's that's really definitely waking me up. So just like he was woken up, we hope that the security ramifications wake all of us up and make sure we keep our devices secure. <laughs> that is not a security ramification. That was not expected. I'm sorry. Everybody hates that. I'm quite sure this was the intention. So in this video, what we're going to show is he has an analog and a digital display of his speedometer, which we all rely on to make sure we don't get pulled over by the police. But watch what happens when you have a device that's unsecured. Hey, you're not moving at all. 
I was he's like, still driving. Block the intersection right now, but that would be dangerous. You could. Yeah. You can just make me go. Right. Okay, so the stuff where you could actually shut the car down or make me spin out of control. <laughs> let's go back to the parking lot. Yeah, let's not do that on the open road. Let's do it somewhere closed off. So, and then in this part, I'm just gonna keep the video running. Um, in this part, he's gonna take him to a parking so lot, which will be more secure. Stop, like stop right now. I'll show you what happens. So we're stopped. Yeah. But now we're not stopped. Oh man. He's overriding. I don't like that sound at all. <laughs> right. yeah, no. it's, oh. Cars usually don't make that sound. That's a scary sound. Oof. I just want to see like some steering and stuff. Yeah, I see some steering. Okay, so get somewhere where we can go backwards. Okay. So then reverse, not touch anything. Uh. <laughs> this is so, him controlling it from the laptop. That's, the guy's not touching anything. That's crazy. I'm gonna tell the car that there's something behind you and you need to stop, and so it'll stop. Okay. So you go ahead. Fuck. <laughs> Pardon for the <laughs> vulgarity there. Now, now keep in mind, this guy luckily didn't want to do anything too malicious. Now, if a malicious user actually got hold of this, they could have taken control of every Jeep Grand Cherokee in the nation, in the world, and messed with it like this. So, with that being said, with that little jib against uh, both the CIA and Jeep, we kind of want to talk about our final thoughts as we wrap up this project. When we first began the project, we didn't know anything about IoT or the protocols used. We had very uh, cursory exposure to the Raspberry Pi and some of the components, and we really got um, a great exposure to all these things, learned how they work inside and out, and were able to explain it in a way that hopefully you guys can understand today. Oh, that's not supposed to play the YouTube video. Oh. Uh, if there's any questions, we'll be taking those. And that one as well. Oh, cool. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. While you guys clap for us, we'd like to clap for the uh, individuals listed on this slide. Uh, first and foremost, Dr. Emil Salib, without whom this project could not have happened. His guidance. <laughs> His guidance, his expertise, and his ability to make us work in ways we didn't realize we could is unfounded by any professor we've ever had. Uh, we'd also like to thank Mr. Safa al Badri for his uh, ability to provide us the equipment necessary to make this project happen. Uh, and some, for those of us who have uh, parents and family in this room, we'd like to give a round of applause to you guys as well. Thank you. And our friends that listen to us complain about this capstone endlessly. The, the one thing that, uh, it, it, this is my fault, is that to uh, have a disclosure that whatever we teach about security, it is not for any other purpose other than educational. And therefore, when we use words like hacking and what have you, we're really doing it in a controlled environment, not for the purpose of enticing or encouraging our students to ill use the skills that we teach them. Uh, they made me very proud and I want to uh, thank them very much for hard work. I'm sorry, the hard time I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to our presentation.